Well, uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, members of the collaborative and guests. Thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion of security in the boardroom, transitioning from fear to leadership. Uh, I'm Tom Skura, today's moderator. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, we obviously don't have open mics, but there's a Q&A box uh, to type in your questions. And certainly we will address them uh, certainly at the end of our discussion here and perhaps as we can uh, uh, during so. Um, this is also an opportunity uh, for those attending uh, to uh, gain one CPE uh, uh, for your accreditations and for learning purposes. Um, before introducing our sponsor and panelists, I'd like to call attention to the title slide. Uh, two things about it, uh, it's a quick guide uh, we decided in 11 pages to succinctly uh, define key points for those CISOs who are engaging with the board to provide them guidance. The word transitioning from fear to leadership, fear may be a, a too strong a word for many CISOs who are experienced with board members, but for some, uh, someone who is new to the role or to an enterprise, it's a very real emotion. And the CISOs on this task force understand that and wanted to create a rational approach to help the new CISO engage in a constructive relationship with the board. And if you've experienced CISO as well, uh, we hope you get some new insights uh, from today's session. So what I'd like to do is to begin by, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words about our uh, executive sponsor and panelist, Sydney Klein is a member of our executive committee. And as a member, she directs the activities of the collaborative, helps decide what task force we're going to do, making sure we're satisfying membership needs. She is the CISO of Bristol Myers and Squibb. I'm sure you've all heard of, of that company as a lead developer and deliverer of innovative medicines. Uh, Sydney comes with 20 years of cyber security experience and she's a strong ally of underrepresented communities and, pen, and spends time fostering a sense of inclusion in a diverse environment. It's, it's, it's a tribute to all the CISOs in the collaborative to want to reach out to others uh, to, to help and to bring cybersecurity uh, to areas in need. Um, she leads uh, Bristol Myers Squibb's digital experience efforts to balance innovation and security while protecting its most valued information. And prior to position there, she served as VP of Cyber at Capital One Financial. So thank you, Sydney, for uh, being our executive sponsor here. And our panelists, we're very privileged today to have three very experienced panelists. Uh, the first I'll introduce is Roland Cloutier. Roland is currently the global CISO of TikTok, the world's fastest growing social media and video platform. He's a cybersecurity leader, strategic uh, security visionary, a uh, board member, and an author. I'd like to point out a book on Amazon that Roland has written called Becoming a Global Chief Security Executive Officer, a how-to guide for next generation security leaders. It's a must read for those mentoring new leaders as well as those aspiring to become one. So I all recommend uh, going out and, and, and getting that, uh, that book again for, for new and seasoned CISOs. Uh, Roland has led privacy and security efforts in many major corporations, among them ADP, and EMC. Uh, my next panelist is Ben Coral. Ben is the VP of cybersecurity for the Coates Group, which is a British multinational company, world's largest manufacturer and distributor of sewing thread and supplies. Um, he serves on the advisory board of Vigitrust and has been an active participant on the cybersecurity collaborative task forces and events for which he readily volunteers. I never have an issue if I ask Ben for something, he's always there. He has also had many years experience in this industry. And he quotes Mark Twain, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. So as I looked at all these things, uh, I, I read further on in his bio and recognized that he is a former Marine and therefore always first in the fight. Semper Fi, Ben, and welcome. And then also as a panelist, who has been a very active player on this task force. Uh, uh, despite being at different places in the company, she uh, attended these sessions and offered her experiences and uh, perspectives. She has led cybersecurity programs at many Fortune 50 corporations, including Time Warner, Coca-Cola, Royal and Campbell's Soup. 
Um, as a seasoned practitioner and early adopter, she has saved millions of dollars in product acquisition deployment costs, which is always a, a good thing to hear, uh, you know, in terms of, of the way she's approached improving security. She is now the founder of a new company called CISO Hive, which provides cybersecurity services appropriate to medium-sized companies. Believe me, there is a huge need in, in that particular area. So welcome panelists. Uh, we really appreciate you all. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, uh, briefly talk about, for those who are not familiar with the Cybersecurity Collaborative, who we are. Um, the Collaborative is uh, for both CISOs and staff. So if, if you're a CISO and you're interested in joining, this is a, for you, but it's also for your staff. For the CISOs, we have boardroom discussions where you have peer-to-peer -peer discussions uh, with CISOs about uh, topics of, of, of interest and concern. Certainly staffing and mentoring are big areas that we're discussing this year. We provide CISOs with a daily morning security report so you never walk into a situation where someone asks you about a, a breach and you're not aware of it. It comes out at 6.30 a.m. Eastern time. But also, this is a resource for your staff. Um, we have library and tools for them if they're starting various programs like third-party risk management or incident management. Um, there are task forces like the ones we have here for those working groups. We've just finished one on incident management. We're starting another one on security monitoring. And it is a way for your staff to get CPEs. We offer for every hour that they participate, one CPE. So again, it, it's a way to meet some of your training needs. So today's topic, we're gonna to give you a little background on the task force. Uh, some perspectives on the CISO and the board in 2022 was a lot different 20 years ago as I remember it. We'll talk about the deliverables of the task force. The task forces um, are there for collaboration, but we always produce some deliverables uh, for members that, that come out of best practices or tools. Um, and then we're really gonna, the presentation in our discussion is going to be around the CISO quick guide uh, to the boardroom. Uh, we'll summarize key points, talk about our task force plan for this year and open it up to Q&A. At the end, there will be a poll for you to answer. And again, um, any of the Q&A questions, please put in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them. So as you can see, see on the no, right side, the I have a very uh, distinguished uh, group of CISOs who contributed uh, mightily to this task force. Um, the, ta the task force represents organizations from different industries and government agencies. In fact, Rohit Tandon from the state of Minnesota was a big contributor here. And uh, we should not fail to recognize that our government agencies have, have similar needs and concerns and must report to their leadership as well. So there were some good perspectives uh, from Rohit as well. It's an opportunity for members to share their challenges, triumphs, and tribulations. Um, we, this is all under Chatham House rules. Uh, we've had our ups and downs in, in, in our industry. We share those with the, with the idea of helping other members uh, in, in their own challenges. And it's a, it's a strong way to do that because you're hearing from your peers and, and not from uh, necessarily those who are uh, promoting different security technologies. Um, and then there's value from the collaboration, as I mentioned, as much as from the deliverables. So Sydney, I, I may have talked a lot about the value, but as an executive sponsor and member here, uh, maybe you can provide your own perspectives on the value of the collaborative uh, to the CISO. Yes, I think the, the greatest thing about the industry that we've chosen is that there is no such thing as competitive intelligence uh, amongst each other, amongst fellow CISOs, amongst fellow security professionals. And having a group that you can go to to talk about whatever challenges that you're seeing, and also having a group that you can go to real time on, hey, I'm, I'm seeing this sort of threat. What are you doing about it? I just got a question from an executive. I'm not really sure how to handle it. Basically, having a group of people who are there who have your back. Uh, I think that, that security at times can be a very daunting and lonely activity. 
but with the collaborative, I think you just have a whole set of peers and organizations that you can reach across lines. I also really do value the fact that it's many different industries. I happen to be in an industry that benefits from having an ISAC and I get great value from that. I think that you need to make sure that you're connecting across a variety of different sources and an ISAC helps me connect to my peers within the industry and the collaborative fills that other need, which is peers throughout all industries so I can understand what's going on. Uh, I will say that my very favorite thing that I leverage is that morning briefing. It is the first thing that I'm reading every day. It frankly allows me to understand how quickly am I leaving my personal activities and diving into work, whether it's driving or working from home. Uh, it really sets my day. And while I think lots of companies have the benefit of some pretty stellar threat intelligence teams, I think that this rivals any of them. Uh, so that's worth its weight in gold and something that I'm especially appreciative of from this group. Thank you very much. And, um, and we find that some members, um, CISOs do allow members of their organizations like their threat intelligence groups or their security awareness groups access uh, to uh, that morning security report so that they can that's right. substantiate uh, what they're doing as well. It is definitely valuable and it's routinely at 6.30 Eastern every morning. So thank you uh, very much for sharing those perspectives with us. So uh, let's level set before we get into the CISO's relationship in the board and just do a little imagination here. Imagine you're the coach of a professional football team, uh, whether you like football or not, but let's, let's just go there for a few minutes. However, there's a lot of uh, constraints here. You are allowed defensive players only. Your job is to prevent the offense from scoring during a game that never ends. Um, you provide briefs to the general manager and owner during halftime sessions that will never add up to a hole. Allowing a field goal in lieu of a touchdown is actually considered a win for you. That permits you to keep your job returned to the field and hope for a similar result by next time. I guess this, this is a, a very uh, non-optimistic view of the world of the CISO, but in fact, um, we, we, we can't really declare victory against the hackers. Uh, we can provide the best defenses and ways to deal with them, uh, but we, we can't stop them and go, and go through that. And, and I, I think that's the challenge and what makes it so difficult uh, to be a CISO is, is knowing you know, every day you're doing your best to pre prevent the, the major hack. And we all know the impacts of those on the business and, and on, on the CISO. Um, so as far as that perspective in the boardroom, uh, clearly now security is a central topic of the boardroom. It's been for several years, but it has evolved over the last 20 years. And the impact of publicly disclosed breaches and regulations and incident disclosure requirements have put this uh, point front and center in front of the board. Um, board members too are becoming more security savvy. Um, there are directors now with security expertise that are elected to the boards that can ask the appropriate questions and understand uh, considerable detail. And there are actual organizations full time uh, many of these that members had mentioned on here that are valuable, um, uh, such as the National Association of Corporate Directors and the Digital Directors Network that actually um, help both the CISOs and directors, uh, uh, you know, address security and the relationships that they have with each other. And reporting on security matters to a board is a major responsibility of the CISO. Um, it's not enough to have to really run a program that deals with disparate organizations responsible for various parts of that program, but uh, you have a major responsibility now to report on security to the board. And it's increasingly more consuming of your time. And the questions you get are oftentimes e even more difficult, maybe not to the point, but you have to address them anyway. So this is the perspective uh, that in, in the world that the CISO is in, and we all have to respect it's a very uh, difficult world to be in. And our job here is to do the best we can to share some insights to help 
make that world better for everyone. Just quickly on task force deliverables, we have two. Uh, and these are for the members of the collaborative. The first is a board presentation template. We are getting a few more slides for this, but we've uh, basically uh, got some very interesting visuals that we do provide members to help them construct their uh, board materials. Uh, some that talk rep you know, representations of risk posture, uh, improving, reducing risks, some very interesting graphs and slides. Again, that is for membership here. And uh, it's useful to get some perspectives to see how members are using metrics and also presenting uh, their views of risk and the security posture uh, that they're managing. The second thing in, that we're going to focus on today and have the panel uh, come into discussion is on the quick guide, which is a short impactful guidance document um, based on the experiences of CISO members. We wanted to make it um, short so it's readable, but we wanted to make sure its content was impactful. And if you go to the right here and kind of look at the, the way we've organized this, it's kind of in a theme and a story, and that came out of our discussions. The first thing is to level set on, you know, what is the board about and what do they want? Because without knowing that, um, you're not prepared uh, to, to really address the board and you may not be prepared for the questions they ask. So the three areas that we covered is really understand what the purpose of the board is and what power does the board have? Um, you may think it has more power than it does. Um, the second is, what are the assurances the board want out of security? What, what are they really looking for? And then the third part of that first section is, what expectations do they have of you as the CISO? So gaining a good understanding of those three areas will, will help you transition to the next areas, which is being prepared for the meeting and conducting the meeting, having the appropriate meeting materials when you're having the session, and being able to answer the questions that you may be asked to answer. And the third thing is really kind of leveraging all of that to be able to lead the cybersecurity uh, for the enterprise as a whole. Um, we've come to the conclusion uh, that this relationship with the board is actually a good leadership opportunity for the CISO. Uh, that once you've gone through the first two phases and you, you've got a good relationship with the board, there are other opportunities for you to do a better job and have your, your company do a better job in protecting its, uh, its uh, assets through a more improved and informed security program. And then we'll end on three leadership anchors that we want you always to come back to as a CISO and, and think about wh whenever you're engaging the board, the three things that are the most important uh, to keep them trusting in you and in your leadership capabilities. So let's start with what is the purpose and power of the board? And I'm gonna go through the first two slides and then have uh, panelists as they see fit, maybe add their own experiences. And to the right of the first slide is generally a snapshot from the, the guidance document we have just to show you um, that we put something together and that's, that's very useful. And there really were things uh, that the board has. They have a fiduciary responsibility. They wanna ensure the current and future shareholder value. We hear about that. Um, and that earnings are growing and that risks are being managed. Um, they do have some power in setting strategic direction. You know, um, shaping major business and policy decisions which are carried out by the executive officers. Um, they want to ensure there's a proper management structure in place uh, for oversight and delivering value. Um, they do elect corporate officers uh, on their, in their, and they do have the power to hire and fire those officers and they often set executive compensation for them. And then the board is made up of directors uh, inside directors could be members of the company or a large shareholder, and there are outside directors as well, uh, members with expertise, expertise perhaps in the area of security and other areas. Um, and then there are committees uh, that uh, operate under the auspices of the board. The typical one that's been around for a while is audit, uh, but risk has come to the fore, and some of the companies uh, that we talk about now have technology committees. So what does this mean for the CISO? 
Um, and we're going to talk a little about European boards. Uh, this is really for US boards. In public US companies, the board usually can't fire you. Well, when we say usually can't fire you, this is after a lawyer kind of looked at what we're doing. It really depends on the charter. And it's important for the CISO to really understand what powers the board has as it's written up legally. Um, in most cases, if you're not a direct corporate officer, they don't have direct power to do that. But that said, um, if they don't have confidence in you, they can certainly talk to those officers and raise those concerns. The second thing, um, you, you know, you're front and center of the board, but it's really not about you. It's about security risks and regulatory compli and compliance. The third is um, boards usually do not make the risk treatment decisions. You come up with a risk score and you say anything below a 62, um, do you want to accept the risk or not? Um, I, I don't think it's going to be a very valuable con conversation. And generally, the board usually does not establish budgets, but they will ask questions about budgets. And sometimes there's a, there's a, a disconnect. Um, so panelists, any, any thoughts on what we've just said here? Any embellishments or, or different views? Yeah, I think you hit on um, a lot of uh, the, the good points, Tom. I, you know, overall, the board's real responsibility is ensure that management is doing their job and you're part of that management structure. And whether you're a corporate officer or not, um, and whether you're easier to fire or not, that's, that's not really you know, what they're gonna be evaluating. Typically, what they wanna know is, do we have a handle on our security situation, risks to the organizations, that there's clear leadership in place and that we have a life cycle management capability to monitor those, those risks and those issues. And, um, and, and they want to see leadership in that position. And, and so when you're in the board meeting and whether it's for 15 minutes, uh, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 40 minutes, uh, unless you have a really bad year, then you might be there like for an hour in a committee meeting. Um, you know, that time uh, should be spent on delivering um, the effective knowledge they need to know that uh, you have it under control and that the organization, uh, the status of the organization and what you're gonna to do to make it better, if it needs to be better. Thank you. And I think that's right. I think the, the, the thing that so many people don't understand is they confuse what management's role is with what the board is. And it's a really easy misunderstanding because I think this is the one thing that when you're growing your career, you don't really get a lot of exposure to until you're in the seat. And so there are lots of statements of, oh, let's go get the board to do that and get the board to do that. But they're really not there for those purposes. So the things that are really listed here, many of those sit with management. It's management that's setting the budget. It's management that's helping you set the, the risk tolerance of the company. It's not so much the board. So there is a purpose to management. And it's often a really good practice to make sure that you're briefing your management and having those asks of management before, because you certainly could get questions from the board of, are you getting everything that you need from management? Do you have all the budget you need? Do you have the right number of resources? But the answer, I know I never want to be in a position to say is, no, I've asked for something and management hasn't given it to me. The board isn't in the position to answer your, your ask with uh, an offer that really needs to be a conversation that you go on with management. Doesn't mean that you can't walk into a room and say that there's a disagreement, but you really want to have that conversation before you go in. Well, thank you, uh, Roland and Sydney. I'm going to, um, uh, those are uh, excellent and informative responses. I'm going to kind of move it along. I know we're running, <laughs> probably need two hours to do this, but I think the key takeaway here is understand the purpose and power of the board, read the board charter, other governance documents and meeting minutes. Now, some people say it might be difficult to, to, to get those, go to the legal office and see if you can do that and just see sort of what they say about security. And then engage, you know, as I mentioned, engage with the legal department. And we'll end this section on a quote from Madame Curie, nothing in life is to be feared, it was only to be understood. I thought those are very wise words. So I'm gonna move on. What assurances uh, does the board want about the enterprise's uh, security posture? So, uh, and we talked about this a little bit. What the board expects, I think, is the program is properly staffed, properly funded. Hence, Sydney, what you said, they may ask you that. Are you getting enough funding and so forth? 
Is it is it credible? Um, it may assume that, but it, can it stand up to legal and regulatory scrutiny? And you know, is it uh, working and improving in terms of uh, identification and mitigation of security risks? So, what does this mean for you as the CISO? Sufficient levels of staffing and funding are your re responsibility. I think I think what was said is they're going to ask, but the, you know, they they don't. Don't get in the middle of a of an argument with your your management at the meeting about not having enough. I think that, that there can be a disconnect, and these are things that you have to resolve outside of the meeting. Um, an obvious one is to model your program on an industry standard, or you know it could be several standards that you're combining. Uh, but don't make it up um, and say this is something that I came up. I think it's the best. I think it it, it hurts your credibility. Have a program in it audited and tested. I know we talked about this in the meeting and sometimes you gotta get a big firm in to come in and do a risk assessment or a security controls assessment. Um, but some that that may help your position because it, it supports independently what you're trying to do and, and takes the onus off of you directly. So it's, it's food for thought. Um, demonstrate that the program works, uh, can be improved and is being improved. I don't think you ever come and say, we've got it nailed. I don't think you say we're a, we're a lousy spot unless you're coming in new and, and you need to work on some things significantly, but kind of take it as it's, it's at a point of time and it, you know it's, it's, it's got value, but it needs to be improved. Um, any other thoughts on you know, what the board wants? Yeah, a, a couple thoughts here. So, don't be surprised if your board asks you at the end, so we're all good, right? Um, I, I may or may not have gotten that question before. And I think it's important to make sure that you're always representing a very balanced view. I often, when I'm preparing my materials, thinking about what if I'm here in six months with a conversation and as Roland says, I'm there for an hour. It's not my standard 20 minute presentation, it's an hour because we have a lot of unpleasant things to discuss. And I don't want people to be caught off guard. I simply think that cybersecurity is an unmitigatable risk. And the fact that we have computers that are connected in the world, you're going to have risk. The question is, are you making well-informed risk decisions? And are you giving transparency to the risk that exists? I also think that the board really, in many cases, doesn't know exactly what they're supposed to be asking you. So for instance, you might want to say, you probably want to understand what my resourcing is. Here's how I feel about it. For instance, in my metrics, which I give to them every quarter when I'm with the board, I tell them, how are we doing on resourcing? How quickly are we finding and responding to incidents? Because that helps remind them, okay, here are the questions that you should be asking me every time. I'm going to pre-answer those questions for you. Good point is to, is to pre-answer the questions by already having them answered in what you're presenting. And, and we'll get to the structure of the meeting, but I think those are excellent points, Cindy. And I think um, the key takeaway here is uh, send your message discussions around your, your program, which should be based on this standard and, and in, independently audited and tested. Talk about your program, not about you. Um, it, it's very important that they understand that. No, absolutely. It, uh, well, before we move on there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, you, you made a couple of comments uh, on, on that last one. Uh, and really, you know, as you're talking about progressing it and everything, uh, you don't want to say, you know, I'm in a bad spot. Uh, what you really want is that third bullet there of the independently audit. They're going to be the ones that say there's some vast areas of improvement that are needed. So you don't want to be the one always saying that, oh, woe is me, the sky is falling. Because again, that also takes you back to number one. We're never going to, in my opinion, ever think I'm staffed enough or have enough funding. Uh, as Sydney was saying, you know, I'm not going to always be able to minimize the risk to where I'm comfortable, but I don't set the risk tolerances. Uh, I build my program based on the risk tolerances that have been set. But based on that, how do I tell a compelling story 
to my executives, again, not to the board, but to my executive staff of this is the funding that we need. These are the people that we need in order to build a program based on the risk tolerances that have already been laid out by the execs. So that's some of the things that popped in my head as, as you were presenting on this slide. And, and I'm glad you, you uh, brought them to the fore, especially, I think what you said is if you have that independent party bring these things out, you know, some of the issues, then, then you can work on them and, and uh, it, it adds to your credibility as well. I think that's an excellent point. So the third thing is what do board members expect um, expect of you as a CISO, okay? What are they looking for? Um, and I think um, it, it, it's, they expect you in generally to lead the security program, okay? That's a very broad term, but um, leadership is, um, leadership is an understanding of these key security risks, plans to address those risks, providing results, are, you actually, are we actually doing something and making sure we have effective response capabilities to risks that are materialized or likely couldn't materialize in our incident response program. What this means for the CISO is you've got to earn their confidence in your leadership abilities. By staying current on security events, I bring up the morning security report they're going to read what's going on in the world and anything that's major there you need to know about. And then potentially, what is its potential impact on your security program in the firm and what are you doing about it? I think they can extend it. The other thing is demonstrate you have support from key stakeholders in the enterprise. Uh, so when you're there, the CEO and so forth um, understands what the program is about and what you're doing is not surprised by what you're saying. We talk about leveraging outside expertise. Did we just lose Tom? I think so, or it got really cold up in Boston and he's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was like, did I just freeze or did Tom just freeze? So, it, you know, we can uh, we could probably just go till he, he comes back. I think, um, you know, this I love this slide and I was waiting. I was I was actually texting uh, a Ben on the side. You know, I, I, I wanted to kind of tie the, the last slide to this slide, because I think what's um, uh, important to understand is really two key concepts. One, they want the, their expectations is that you know what you're doing. And that you're large and in charge, that you um, really have the capabilities to be able to deliver um, the uh, the assurances they need uh, to the public that the company is doing everything they can. And, and one of the most uh, most important things that was ever stated to me uh, with uh, a board member was a simple question. And the question was this, Roland, how do you know? And I was about to go down this path of, you know, all this fancy security stuff. He said, no, no, no. How do you really know? And it was a discussion on transparency and ability um, to understand the totality of the company and the business and the business processes. And that, that really changed my reflection. So remember, when they're talking about their expectations of you, um, they're, they're, really, um, they're really looking at uh, what you bring from a management. And we keep using the management. Remember in your mind, you are the management. <laughs> You're the security component of the management, but when they're assessing management, they're assessing you. Uh, so make sure you know what uh, what you're doing and and have that detailed level of understanding before you go into the board. Yeah, I think if we take us forward, um, the next topic we were going to talk about is meeting preparation and conduct. Uh, how can you successfully prepare for and conduct your meeting? I, I think preparation is really key. Uh, you know, something I'm always doing is making sure, first of all, I'm reading the morning briefing and then my team knows exactly when I'm going in with the board and anything that's kind of late breaking, uh, what that looks like. But I will say, and this goes into our, our content a little bit, it's really important to have a, a story that kind of translates from one meeting to the next meeting to the next meeting. Because I think if you go in and you have a whole new different set of slides that look nothing like what you had before, it's really hard for your board members to be able to connect this to your last story. 
And so many approaches are very formulaic. My formula is I always start with the outside in, what's happening in the external threat landscape and what is the impact that we're seeing within the company. Then I do a deep dive on a couple of those things. So if ransomware is really hot at the moment, what's happening there? SEC um, is a hot topic that I would bring up, of course, with the proposed rules. There's a lot of interest from boards on that as it might impact their board composition. But Roland, what, what is your formula? How are you get, dealing with expectations there in, in meeting prep? I, th I think there's a, there's a few from a meeting prep pers uh, perspective that are absolutely key. First is with my general counsel um, or the secretary of the board. I think um, we, we work so closely with them anyways, and when we're talking about regulated spaces or we're talking about public company requirements, ensuring that we have a full understanding of legal complexities and what the board is facing, right? Some of the questions that you need to answer before you go in there are based on things that are happening within the greater environment. So prepping with my um, either the secretary or the board of the general counsels, um, super important. Sydney mentioned um, uh, also previously that it was it was important to have um, this discussion about what what's going on in the company and make sure that we show and we we know what's going on. I, sometimes it's not about our program. Sometimes it's about the company and and making sure that we show that collaborative capability across organizational structures. Some of us report to a CIO. Most of us don't anymore. But there's CIOs involved, there's R&D involved, there's, you know, depending what companies you're in, there's trust and safety organizations. So how do you tie that story and that overall leadership across the board? So preparing with your partners on the story that you're going to deliver and those key concepts, I think are also really, really important. And double check your numbers. Any number you go in there with, um, if if there's a mistake, the, the, most of the board our, our members, folks, their CEOs or former CFOs of, of major multinational companies, they're going to see them. So make sure you double check every single one of your stats and numbers before you go in. So Sydney and, and Roland, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this was a really important topic for me as part of the collaborative um, because I've learned the hard way that you need to prepare. And one of the things that I did was I took um, again, materials that I knew the board would, would ask. And, and, I, and I generally lose, I, I use the NACD material and I used the questions and I circulated that and I got complete consensus before I actually went to the board. And, and so my, my comment is that the reason why this is important because generally you have to submit the board materials what, three, three weeks in advance maybe sooner than that. I actually started my prep four weeks before that, which was, you know, getting consensus, sending it to IT infrastructure, sending it to everybody. So that by the time it was actually due for board prep, which was three weeks before the board meeting. I mean, it, so it was almost like a project plan for me. You, I, I found that I had to create a project plan around board meetings. So I, I just share that because the couple of times that I didn't and you went in and you thought, who am I throwing under the bus or who's not going to agree with my statement? It didn't feel good. And so I, I will say this, you actually need a project plan to prepare for board meetings. That's my comment. Hi, sorry, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. My whole internet went down. Luckily, I have a backup plan, and my biggest backup was having you all here carry on. And this is what you have to do as a CISO sometimes. <laughs> so well, let me. I, I hope I hope I was heard because that was the one thing of all the things yeah. that I was really specific about during the planning was having a project plan. And, and, a, and a timeline and key stakeholders who would help you prepare for the board. Because I don't think, even though you're preparing and you might be the only person in the room, um, it, it's, it, you're really representing a lot of other people when you get there. So let me, let me move on. So where did we end up? We talked about the expectations Yep, Tom, we're, we're um, moving into the, the content now. We've covered the prep and the conduct, and we were kind of merging that with the content, which is next. Okay. 
So, um, so just one thing, I don't know if we talked about guidance for the new CISO. One of the things is to understand why you were hired. Um, I think it's important, uh, you know, it's a transform or create a program. Uh, interview uh, enterprise executives to get their perspectives on the directors and the questions they might ask. Develop your own perspectives on the program. I remember Andres here who was uh, on our team said, uh, he was new, he came in, he said, I need 90 days to assess what's going on and develop a plan to deal with the low hanging short term fixes, the long term projects, um, use outside expertise if necessary and avoid negativity. I mean, um, again, if the previous CISO was let go and there were issues, um, be careful on how you're raising that uh, because it's, it, it kind of hurts your credibility. So um, I believe this is where we left off. So it, we're talking it, about- Tony, so yeah. if I can just comment on that one thing, um, a, 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 a good suggestion here, uh, because we all run into this. We're given a pile of poo and we got to fix it. Um, and and it, it's, you know, we, we focus on the quality of the business and delivering, you know, what we've committed to the market or committed to our customers or committed to our shareholders. That should be your focus. And then when we talk about um, what's being fixed, if it, if it starts going to, well, whose fault and whose problem, um, it, the focus should, should always flip back to, um, I think the important message here is how we're going to fix it and when we're gonna fix it. And, and that really typically switches the conversation. Um, so you can stay out of that negative, negativity. It flips it over to a positive comment. We have a, we know what we're doing. We have a focus on it and we're executing to it. And here's who's responsible for fixing it. And, and that gives them the confidence, um, again, whether it's you or someone else, um, that now you're migrating away from the pointing of fingers and, you, and you're sticking um, on the topic in, in driving the company forward. I think that's a great point. So stick to your message, I think, is another thing, right, is, is important. Um, and uh, engage credible third party security expertise to evaluate uh, your program for reviews if necessary. Um, moving on, material topics here. I'm trying to move through this because we're running out of time a little bit. Here's some of the typical um, areas that are, are, are presented in a board meeting, right? Um, status of previous asks, threats and issues, key risks. I think, Renee, you talked about having a plan to talk about this. And I think, um, as Sydney talked about, talk about incidents and audit findings, um, compliance and certifications, if we're on track to maintain those. Security posture is still often presented in terms of control maturity and showing progress uh, plan. Um, and I think the guidance on this is present risks in understandable terms. Uh, rather than taking the ISO 2705 view, which is very long, elongated, keep it in simple terms. Keep the chart simple. The chart should answer a question, not raise questions on, on interpretation. Uh, incorporate valid independent data when necessary and use metrics consistently from one B to the next. The obvious thing is not to change how you're calculating something and spend uh, 20 minutes to do that. And in terms of the guidance, I think this is what you said, Roland, too. Um, you really, your presentation is a story. What are the issues? How do you know they're the issues? What are you doing to address them? Who is responsible to address them? And when will they be addressed? Anyone yeah, else? I, want to yeah, I, 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 think, I think you hit it. Um, and again, I'll allow my esteemed colleagues to um, weigh in, but you don't just show up with a duck, I, I think. You, you, this deck has to be socialized. And, and in my world, it was socialized with the audit committee. Um, so, so the audit committee chair had just sort of, the head had just sort of agree the deck um, so that he would get behind it. Um, and that's why I think Sydney's comment about you don't just sort of willy nilly change things because it's really not for you to do that. At the same time, when I think about what I presented, there were we had five strategic imper imperatives that held true over two to three years. And we presented those. So when I think about it, it was probably eight slides that went into the board prep. It's not what we discussed. It was already submitted ahead of time, but it was the board prep 
five strategic um, imperatives, how we're doing against the imperatives, you know, one, one slide per imperative. And then quarterly, we had a two pager that went out that was predetermined and agreed upon um, that didn't change unless the head of the audit committee said it could change. Um, and so, so again, I'll come back to like, it would be a mistake to think you can just sort of create this thing with anything for the board without a high degree of collaboration, socialization, um, and and that's what I that's what I really want to impress upon people that are leading. I think it's a mistake that I made in in you know a long time ago. Hopefully not recently, but I'm more you just sort of walk in and you think that it's okay. The amount of prep for this this meeting and 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 the agreement and and just making sure that again coming back to staff, the staff have to show are you doing better or worse. I mean that's kind of what they have to show but I'll come back to like I don't don't underestimate or minimize the level of activity that goes into preparing for a your first board meeting because I think that would be the longest and then just even after that I mean you, you may be cut in half but it's a ton of work Oh, it, it is. And I think you bring up a good point is that's what it takes so much time is to socialize everything and prepare in advance, uh, you know, and make sure you get other constituents on board. Huge, huge point. So, yeah, you can't wait a week before the presentation. Obviously. No, no. And that's one of the things, Tom, is, uh, you know, I always say there should be no surprises. Everything. And this is a question that that came through as well. Everything is shared ahead of time. Uh, I'm using the same type of visuals. I'm using the same numbers and metrics, the same type of bar charts. I'm not even changing from a pie to, to anything else. And realize it will be read. Every board member will read what you sent ahead of time. They will compare it to what I sent last time. So they'll pull what I sent this time, read it pull last times and review it, which is why that consistency has to be there. I think Roland is absolutely right. Numbers will be checked. I got called to the carpet for an inaccurate number. It, it was not good, uh, but references will also be checked. If I say this is a Gartner and I don't put a reference that they can actually click on and check, but I just put a, you know, thing out there of this is where I got this, I'm going to be called for that as well. So cite where you're pulling things from, realizing it's going to be checked. And again, do not try to surprise anything. Don't try to come in here with FUD and lead with fear uh, to, to get things on your side. Uh, I do not like surprises uh, any more than the board does. Good points. In the interest of time, I'm going to advance uh, these slides a little quickly so we can get to the answers. I will say to the members in the audience, we'll we will provide a copy of this presentation upon request. To members of the collaborative, uh, you'll get it as part of your normal correspondence. To those who are our guests, we will definitely uh, uh, allow you the opportunity to get a copy of this. And I just think, uh, and I think to Renee's point, there are questions you're going to be asked um, and they often fall in these areas. And, Types of questions are actually in the document. I won't go through each of them. But the interesting things about these questions, I think the key point is prepare answer these questions in advance with the help of key stakeholders. Anticipate them. Be prepared for some, some curveball questions. Um, the, the ones about how secure are we, are we secure? And I think the one that Renee says got into the technical views of stopping lateral movement from a, a, a threat actor. Uh, you can get all of these kinds of things and, or how do we compare with the industries? It, you know, often hard to, to answer these, but uh, again, uh, we have a list of these in our document and those you can uh, definitely refer to. And um, the last- but One quick reminder, Tom, for everyone is that your board members also sit on boards of other companies yeah. too. Uh, so it will not be, it was not unusual for me to get a call from like, let's say the, hypothetically the CISO of 
Home Depot or the CISO of, you know, another major multinational and said, so-and-so is on your board. Um, hey, can you give me kind of a base understanding of uh, the, the type of questions they're asking um, that aren't specific to the company, more about the industry? Uh, it, and so that does happen, you know, th when they sit on multiple boards, sometimes connecting with other CISOs about like, what are, what are some of those tough uh, curveballs that folks are throwing? That's not, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a competitive issue with, you're not betraying the trust of the board. What you're, what you're doing is you're doing the research on what uh, your, your board is going to expect of you. Um, and so that's a, a great time to collaborate um, across uh, the industry with your peers. Yeah. So Roland, you bring up a good point. Again, coming back to, I don't want to diminish the amount of prep that would go into a good more be good board meeting. So I looked up all my board meeting uh, board uh, board members in advance of the meeting, and I would look up whether companies had had experienced a breach. Okay, in in the interim, and lo and behold, I found one of my board members had been through a breach. Well, I, I had to research the breach because that was the curveball question that got asked of me, which was how was I prepared to deal with lateral movement? Because that's how they had been compromised. So it's not only like, again, we come back to the internal stakeholders, but it's the, the people on the outside and the amount of work that you should probably do just to validate, again, the you know the circumstances that your board has been through in the last x amount of time since you met with them um but but i agree this is kind of a a, a community effort almost to get ready for the board meeting yeah i i think you're absolutely right about that and again it's very very time consuming um just going through this uh, the opportunities here are and we talked about this for now, making cybersecurity an enterprise top wide uh, enterprise uh, uh, priority um, is, is important. And in other words, getting other organizations involved in this because the visibility is at the board. I mean, typically it might be IT patching and application organizations, um, but it could be others as well. Um, setting objectives and goals to meet the board expectations, you know, um, um, forcing reluctant stakeholders to participate. You know, metrics is a, is a good way to do that. And, and uh, all, we all work together because we want to, for example, make sure critical security passes are applied on time as an example. But the last thing, and it is a challenge for CISOs, is the we call rogue environments in the security fold, bringing them in. Um, rogue may be a strong term, but there's shadow IT organizations that will go off and engage in cloud computing services unbeknownst to the CISO. Um, and all the security concerns with that configuration wise. And again, often operations technology, organizations and manufacturing, um, that's off, often an, an isolated uh, organization, obviously though with significant security risks for the organizations, but it is an opportunity to galvanize uh, the company around that. And it's important too uh, that you, I'll all immediately after each meeting and follow through to the next meeting in terms of addressing the objectives. In other words, this, this is guiding the leadership of your program. Um, so your interactions with the board members should lead them to an understanding that security risks are in all functions of the business. However, it doesn't mean you disavow uh, your responsibility. So let's move can I, on. Can I say something there uh, real sure. quick? Because actually I, I've studied the NICD guidance, the national Associated Corporate Directors. And I'm not gonna be able to quote it chapter and verse, but there's a statement in there that says, you need to understand your environment and be prepared to talk about like emerging risk. And I think what you just talked about there is the things that, you know, if we were to put blinders on, we would not necessarily address, but there's a whole section that that I that I saw in the last guidance to the board, which was you need to think about the future, and supply chains part of that as well as what I'm going to call your landscape, and you need to understand your landscape. Um, 
And it's the first time I've seen it. And I think that's a challenge for a lot of companies. Like, how do you know, I mean, what our actual, our global footprint is? To your point, OT, I mean, OT generally resides outside of IT. These are conversations that have to be had, including the fact that it's not so much rogue, but the, rep the reporting and is, is different. And you've just got to figure out how to bring that into the fold um whatever that may look like but but boards boards are being conditioned to think about the future exactly um i remind everyone there's a some poll questions hopefully uh, you'll answer those i know we're running toward the top of the hour i think that's a good point um think about the future of the company and 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 digital technology and where it's going and how security is going to play in that is is um, it, it's hard, but I think you're right. That has to come into the equation. Um, the anchors um, that you need to uh, be concerned with here are um, a, company, a cybersecurity program and plan. Um, the second is making sure you're taking actions and showing results. And the third is uh, a leading uh, presence always. So, Focus on your program and plan in the context of all we talked about. Make sure you're showing some actions and maintain your leadership. And the sum is um, basically address your fears, your knowledge, show leadership through inter interactions with the directors and use your relationship with the board to advance cybersecurity. Um, I will send everyone uh, this uh, presentation We'll now go to Q&A. Remember, you get one CPE credit. Uh, here's uh, how you can reach out to us for a copy of the presentation and more information about the collaborative. Um, questions, Q&A. I'm sorry we didn't have a lot of time getting to them. Uh, let's, let's see what we can uh, take a look at here. Yeah, you know, um, Kevin asked one at the beginning. Uh, and I, I think it's a great question um, because it's it's, it's, it's about how you drive and I, I think lead change as, as a CISO. A lot of people are, are concerned. The answer to these type things are typically transparencies and requirements to make it successful. So if you can, whether you're talking to the board or you're talking to your executive leadership team, and, and, and here we're talking about implementing an agile DevSecOps capability, um, you know, and whether that's specifically for product development or uh, for management of your enterprise security function. I, I think sitting down in order for this to work, well, the, here are the six benefits and, and, and why the industry has gone in this direction. But for, in order for it to work here, we have to do these 12 things really well. And we're not gonna do, you know, we're not gonna implement Sec DevOps unless we do these 12 things. And here's how we're gonna measure them. So it gives you the opportunity to talk about leadership, structure and quality, um, as well as driving metrics for the company. So it's a, it's a great question. Um, and and uh, it, it's a great opportunity for CISOs to lead. Well, and I'm uh, glad you picked that one. I've been looking at it the whole session and, and really thinking about it. I, I feel like we could do an entire session on just that question. It is so challenging. It is kind of the summary of why these jobs are challenging. I think one helpful activity is to talk about um, what's the likelihood of the what if. And then in making any decision, whether it's a security decision or, or just a technology decision, I like to think about two questions. Um, what's the worst that can happen and how reversible is that decision? And if the worst that can happen is not very big, especially if it's not very likely and your decision can be reversed in five minutes with a quick script, then maybe it's worth pursuing. So You'll typically have to take some baby steps to bring your, your board along if they're really who you're struggling with being more risk averse, but that technique may help. Uh, I, I like it because, uh, you know, I, you phrase it better than I did, Cindy. I, I'm always going with the so what? Yeah. Well, this might happen, so what? Uh, I like the way you phrase it better because it's always like, so okay, this just happened. So what? What's that impact going to be truly to the business? Uh, how can we recover from it? What would it look like? Uh, but you phrase it a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, kindly than I do. So I like it. I, I think it was an excellent question. I'm glad you all picked up on it. One more we can. And good questions. And, uh, you know, uh, how do you recommend handling BOD questions that challenge management decisions? 
So you're kind of caught in the middle, I think is the question. <laughs> Don't everyone drop off like I did accidentally. <laughs> Any thoughts? Hey, in a virtual world, uh, you know, connectivity challenges happen, so you might drop off on, on your board meeting. I think uh, this is where preparation really comes in very well. There are a lot of tough questions that you can anticipate. And as Renee said, making sure that you're really thinking about who are your allies in that room and um, how are you going to address the, the expected questions, because many of them aren't going to really surprise you, but um, you're, you're going to want to be on the same page with others when you answer or make sure that people know you're not on their page. Yeah, and the consistent uh, answers is important. I think it was Roland who said earlier, my board members sit on other boards. I have sent notes to the other CISOs of those. What did you say in your last one? The, the type of questions that were asked, whether it's by my board member or the others that was there because they were there too, what were those questions? What were the answers? I want to make sure that I'm not completely deviating from what they said. Uh, you know, so it opens a report. It helps your professional networking as well. Uh, but again, that consistency of answers helps. Uh, and then if you're talking in the same line and somebody else is questioning you, I've seen that board member jump in to support me against or against not uh, with other board members be, uh, questioning me. Well, I, to, I know we're at the top of the hour, and I'm going to close by saying um, this is the caliber of CISAs we have at the Collaborative. So, I mean, you can see the, the answers and their experience, and we encourage uh, new members to join because you'll have a lot to contribute and you'll have a lot to receive, as you've seen today from our uh, esteemed panelists. I really would like to thank the panelists here today for really opening up and providing great, great insights. We've gotten wonderful comments on your perspectives. We hope this has been a help to everyone. And uh, you know, again, thanks for being here, everyone uh, spending your time today, and we hope you found it useful. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Done.